seniors coming to sing, right? Come ahead. We got one, two volunteers. <laughs> there comes another one. Yes, come right on. We'll, maybe we ought to have an invitation first. And <laughs> get some repentance going on. Now, <laughs> this is a better looking crowd now. Come right ahead. what brother Danny said he said uh, he said he still didn't think of himself as a senior you know I saw on Facebook today you know they've got those little memes on there I get all I get a bunch of new jokes off of there so I've got some new stuff to tell you unless you read the same ones I did if uh, if they're if they're not new to you just pretend like they were and laugh anyway and that'll be an encouragement to me <laughs> but I, I read one of those today that said uh, if I'd have said, let me, let me get it straight here. It says, I didn't, yeah, senior moment. 
I just thought it would, I just thought growing old would take longer. <laughs> I just thought growing old would take longer. I mean, I've signed up on Medicare and look at me. You can tell by looking at me I shouldn't be on Medicare. They've made a mistake. <laughs> it should have been for some old person. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I guess Medicare will be the future of all of us at some point or other. Getting older is not all it's cracked up to be, but I, I'll, I'll grant you one thing. It's better than not getting older. <laughs> it's better than the alternative. Does everybody have a lesson? Anybody need a lesson? Has everybody got one? I guess what I'm asking. Okay, if you need one, need one right over here. Brother Noah needs one. Who else needs one? Anybody else? I like to print these things up because they keep you from going to sleep. Although writing didn't keep me from going to sleep when I was in Bible college, I've got notes to prove it. Where, my, where I went to sleep and my pen just kind of glided off the edge of the paper. <laughs> uh, good old days. Amen. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Reaching on the subject tonight, the times of the Gentiles. Daniel chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in verse number 24. Daniel chapter 2, verse number 24. The vision or dream rather that uh, Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had and he couldn't get anybody to interpret it for him and Daniel stepped up and with God's help he did the task Daniel chapter number 2 and verse number 24 therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon he went and said thus unto him destroy not the wise men of Babylon Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon the bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes that, that shall make known the interpretation to the king and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart thou O king sawest and behold a great image this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible this image's head was of fine gold his breast and his arms of silver his belly and his thighs of brass his legs of iron and his feet of part iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, and the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Father, I pray that you'd give us unction from on high. Lord, I pray that you'd not only show us the truths, the facts, the precepts and principles of this passage of Scripture, but Lord, I pray that you'd stir our hearts that we might use what we learn to be better Christians, that we could face the trials in the future with confidence, as did Daniel. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless us tonight with sweet fellowship from on high. 
Let us revel and revere thee. I pray that you'd bless now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The times of the Gentiles. King had seen in his dream this colossal, gigantic statue. Not just an image, but it was a statue. It was not an idol, but it was a statue. A tall statue having uh, been made of metal in this dream, the finer metals on top descending to the lower metals. And uh, he saw this dream in this dream, and he was not able to understand what it meant. He, he knew Nebuchadnezzar was the king pretty much of the world. And uh, he was the most powerful man on earth at the time. And yet he was troubled because he knew this dream contained something that was greater than even he was. And because he didn't know what it meant, he was troubled. And his sleep, the Bible says, departed from him. He could not he could not go back to sleep. He could not rest. He couldn't find peace. He had to know what this meant. Kind of reminds me of the preacher who said a woman called him in the middle of the night one night. The phone rang. The preacher picked up the phone, and the woman at the other end was one of his church members. He said, is something wrong? She said, yeah. She said, uh, I have woke up. She said, it's about 1 a.m. I can't go back to sleep. He said, well, what do you want me to do? She said, could you just preach to me for about five minutes, and I think it will put me back to sleep. <laughs> now, when your sleep departs from you, 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 you get troubled, and you'll do about anything. And so this, this king is going to have these wise men and soothsayers, magicians, and fortune tellers, all these uh, Chaldeans are going to be executed because they can't, uh, they can't tell him what the dream was, much less the interpretation. And Daniel being now classified as one of the wise men because he's been schooled and his friends have been schooled in the things of the Chaldeans, and so he's going to be executed with the rest. And so he's, he says, uh, wait, Captain, wait a minute. Instead of being so hasty, why don't you tell uh, the king I'd like to see him, and I believe I, can, uh, I believe I can get him some help on this. And so Daniel confidently goes before the king and says, King, if you'll give us a little time, I think we can come up with an answer for you. And so he does. And as he goes before the king, he tells him very confidently what we have just read here, what he saw in the dream. He didn't get to the interpretation yet in what we just read, but we'll read it before the night is over. But he saw a huge statue that covers a sweeping view of history. And we'll look at it in a little bit of detail tonight. Notice on your outline, the very first thing is Daniel's prophetic theme. His prophetic theme is verses 31 through 45. Notice the substance of the king's dream. Let's see the substance of it. Look at verse number 31 with me once again. In verse 31, he says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. What does it mean to be a, a great image? Well, it doesn't mean uh, a lot of things. It does mean at least one thing means that it was huge, great, spectacular. And it was great in a lot of ways. Look at, look at what else it says about it. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness. It had some sort of brightness to it. Uh, it had a, the head, we see, was made of gold, right? And so this gold evidently was a very beautiful, deep, and gleaming, uh, almost blinding brightness of gold. And, and the silver was shining and the, and the metals must have been gleaming in his dream and showed him such a brightness and even Daniel saw this and he says it was great in that it was big and it's great in its brightness and it says and it was excellent what does that mean? it's excellent that means the purity of that gold must have been very superior the silver must have been stunning and pure and he says it was excellent and stood before thee so this image, the statue, is not Nebuchadnezzar because it's standing before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king sees it. So he's not it, and he knows it. And uh, he's troubled about it. And it says, and the form thereof was what? Terrible. I think that means in today's vernacular, maybe our young people would say, man, that's awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. Awesome. What is awesome? Man, it means, it means you're awestruck. It means you're flabbergasted. It means you look at it 
and, and this causes so much, so much concern, and uh, and it is so involved that that you just don't look at it in any other, in any other way besides in maybe fear, reverence, and rightly so because this statue was revealed to the king by none other than God himself. God gave this image to the king. The image is head, verse 32. Notice, the, we'll look at the details now, the details of the image. <coughs> We're talking about the substance of the king's dream, just the, the parts that, that tell us something in these verses and the details of the image is found in verses 31. Look at verse 32. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass. And verse 33, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Now the, the iron might have been perhaps cast iron, and you see, the, you see the value of the metals going down, descending from gold to the less valuable, less precious metal of silver, and silver is still precious. And then it goes down to the brass. The brass is a, is a very useful metal and uh, made of what? Copper and zinc. And then you go on down and there's iron. Maybe it's cast iron and part, part iron and part clay. I had it in my head years ago when I read this I, because one of, the, one of the verses refers to it as miry clay. I had it in my head that this was soft, malleable clay. But no, the, the context indicates that it must have been brittle because it's going to be broken later. And so that clay was taken out of a miry pit, but it's been, it's been hardened. It's been, it's been baked into a tile, and the, and the part of the, of the feet and the toes that are clay are brittle, baked, porcelain-type clay, and it's mixed with the iron. How strong do you think that would be? The iron is strong. But when you try to mix iron and clay together, you're not going to have a very strong alloy, are you? I don't know if it was marbled with the clay or, or if every other toe was clay. It doesn't say, does it? But we just know it's part of one and part of the other. And the strength of, of this statue would still have a lot of strength in that iron. Iron's not as valuable as brass. It's not as valuable as silver and certainly not valuable as gold. But, but it would still be strong. And so we're seeing a a descending value of the metals used. And so if you notice also in verse number 34, it says, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. And verse 35, Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like chaff, chaff being on the threshing floor when they would uh, when they would smash the wheat on a hard surface out in the valley there <coughs> it'd be almost like concrete and then smash that wheat and uh, and beat it and uh, flail it and then they throw the throw the grain and the uh, the chaff up in the air the chaff being the hull that came off of the wheat they'd throw it up in the air and let the breeze blow the chaff away and and Daniel tells the king you saw a stone. You saw a stone cut out of a mountain, and this stone was cut out without hands. And I think that must have troubled the king. And this stone was hurled at the very feet of that image and right at the weakest part of the image. The gold head was strong. Silver breast and arms strong. And uh, the brass, strong. But then where the iron and the clay are mixed, it gets weak. And that's exactly where the stone is hurled and he topples that huge image over. And uh, he says in verse number uh, 36, this is the dream and we will tell thee the interpretation uh, therefore, thereof before the king. So you'll see there that the source, uh, if, if we go slowly through here and look at verse number uh, 37, we'll see the significance of the king's dream and you see the source of it. You see domination. Uh, this, this, this huge image 
reflects the domination. These are world empires, and, uh, and each one gets a little bit weaker. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold that we'll see in just a little while. In verse 37, he says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. So the significance of the dream begins by showing him the source. Look at the source of his power again. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. What's the source of his kingdom? What's the source of Nebuchadnezzar's power? What's the source of his authority? It came from God. Friend, any time anytime anybody has any authority in this old world, anytime we have anything going for us, we can just rest assured that we didn't come up with it on our own. I've heard people say, well, I, I don't need God for anything. I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. No, you didn't. You might have thought you did. But God gave you the ability to bend over. God gave you the ability to bend your arms and to, and to flex your muscles. And uh, without God, we don't have anything. This We're talking about a great king who for all practical purposes, rule the world. And yet, he got that power from God. He didn't know it. He hadn't been aware of it. But he is now. Did you notice Daniel told him? Daniel said, let me tell you where you got your power from. Let me tell you where you got your kingdom from. Let me tell you where you got your authority. Nebuchadnezzar came from the God of heaven that we're going to tell you about. That's the source of it. And then the scope of his power, verse 38. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the, of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now drop, go back up to verse number 36. I want to catch this before we move away from it. In verse number 36, <coughs> Daniel speaking said, this is the dream. Did you notice he is very confident there? He said, this is the dream. I think this, this world ruler, he's sitting there, he's not saying a word. He asked Daniel, can you tell me the dream and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel begins to speak. And you don't hear another word out of King Nebuchadnezzar till the whole thing is finished. He's awestruck that Daniel knows. And he knows Daniel knows, <laughs> and he's listening. And Daniel very confidently, because his confidence is in God, he says, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation. Daniel's not being cocky. He's just being confident. He knows that God has given him the vision. Where else would he get it? None of the soothsayers and magicians, Chaldeans could do it. Daniel went to prayer, and he got it from God. And notice the pronoun there, we. This is the dream, and we will tell thee the interpretation there. Uh, who is the we? Daniel's the one doing the talking. Why do you think he said we? Well, God's included there, isn't he? So it could be. Some of the, some of the learned men say, well, he used the pronoun we because he's saying, we will tell you, God's, gonna, God's revealing it to me, and I'm going to say the words out loud. And so we, me and God, and so I think there's truth there. But wait a minute. What happened when at the very first, when, uh, when it's announced that if he doesn't get the uh, dream and the interpretation thereof, he's going he's gonna to exterminate all the wise men and all the Chaldeans, including the Hebrew children. What did Daniel do immediately? He went and said, boys, let's have a prayer meeting. Remember that? Daniel said to his fellow men, who had, his young men who came out of, uh, Israel, the fellow Hebrews, he said, let's have a prayer meeting because if we don't get an answer from God, this crazy king is going to kill us. I think it's twofold. I think it's we, meaning yes, me and God, and these fellows who went with me in prayer to get the answer. We. And I think there's even another reason. Because of the humility of Daniel. I mean, it just sounds a little bit arrogant for him to say, I will tell you what this means. That would be leaving God out and his fellow men. 
That'd leave out God who gave him the interpretation and the men who helped him pray. And so out of humility, I think we, because he wanted to include God, he said we, and because he didn't want to leave, he wasn't trying to be a one-man show. You know, if we do anything uh, for the glory of God in this church, you know it doesn't happen because of one person, but we do it together. Anytime we get lifted up with pride and think we're doing something great and it's me that built my Sunday school class. No, wait a minute. Wasn't God involved? I hope he was. It was me that, uh, that, that, that did this great musical presentation. No, wait a minute. There might have been a pianist involved and there might have been some fellow singers involved and there might have been a songwriter involved. There might have been some people praying <laughs> involved. And so if we have... If we have anything to glorify God with out of our service in this church, I, it's we. It's we. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't like to hear somebody in the church say, well, I don't know about what y'all are doing. Another church member says that. Y'all? It's not y'all. It's we, isn't it? Especially if we fail. I'd rather say, we, it's not y'all. <laughs> You know, we tend to want to be, it's me if it's successful and it's y'all if it failed. <laughs> but it ought to be us, whether we're winning or losing. Amen. Then going down to the bottom of verse number 38, he says, Thou art this head of gold. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. <coughs> um, his kingdom and he is he is intertwined with this kingdom the language indicates that he and the kingdom are one and the same he representing the kingdom but it's called the head of gold and Daniel says Nebuchadnezzar you're the head of gold representing the kingdom well, was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom bigger than these that would follow? See what's happening here. The gold, the head of gold is the Babylonian kingdom. Are you with me? In fact, if you want to fill it in on your, uh, on, on your blanks, uh, we go to the deterioration point on there and uh, the future kingdoms, verse 39, and then the final kingdom, verses 40 through 43. The might with which it commences... Well, that's the head of gold, and the mixture with which it concludes is that last kingdom, the one that's part iron and part clay. So here you have the head of gold. The first kingdom at the top is the kingdom of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he says there's going to be another kingdom, king, that follows you. Well, let's read it and, and get the language straight. It says, verse 39, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as a lion, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron breaketh all these things, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron and the, uh, the iron mixed with miry clay and as the toes of the feet were a part of iron and part of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but they shall not cleave one to another even as the iron is not mixed with clay and so <clears throat> we have a succession of empires. This is the time of the Gentiles. The time of the Gentiles uh, begins with Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire, that gold head. And then next comes the chest of arms and silver, which would be the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. And then that one would fall. And then Alexander the Great's ancient Greece uh, empire would come next in the thighs of bronze, belly and thighs of bronze or brass, and then the legs of iron would be the Roman em Empire, and uh, then the feet of iron and clay would be the restored Roman Empire that will come yet. It's the future. It hasn't happened yet. The Roman Empire that 
that fell back in the early centuries after Christ, it's not gone forever. It's coming back. And it's coming back uh, in the tribulation time. And maybe it's forming now. And so we have a succession, or I should say a digression, of kingdoms. As each kingdom comes on the world scene, the times of the Gentiles begins with, with Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, and it will end when Jesus comes back, and Jesus is going to be that stone that is hurled at the feet of that revived Roman Empire. Are you with me? The revived Roman Empire at the end of the seven years of great tribulation then Christ will come back and he will smash that, that revived Roman Empire and uh, that confederation of nations uh, that will be over yonder somewhere on the other side of the world in the Mideast. That revived Roman Empire is going to be collapsed when Jesus comes back and he will set up his kingdom. And that's why the, the Bible says that stone that's cut out without hands becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. That means that in Scripture, the, uh, the mountain is symbolic of a kingdom. And so Christ's kingdom is going to expand around the globe. Now Nebuchadnezzar, let's go back to the head of gold. <coughs> and uh, the head of gold is said to be the highest quality here. Not because it's bigger in fact, Nebuchadnezzar's empire did not reach around the world. He did not control every group of people. He could have. He was powerful enough to. Had there not been so much space and time involved, he could have, he could have subdued. He had the power and the authority to subdue every group of people, every tribe on earth. But because of travel... We didn't have jet planes and, and ships like we do now back then. And so he didn't conquer every country. But what then is the reason that he's called the head of gold? And why is his kingdom said to be superior to the ones that would follow? Well, it's not quantity, but quality. Gold is more pure and more valuable than the silver that would follow it. Can you tell by looking that the, that, that the head of a person is not bigger than the, the breast and arms? <laughs> I mean, if, if your head was as big as your chest and your arms, you'd have a big head, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> so it's not that it's, his empire was bigger than any of the others. It's because of the quality of it. And kind of like this. Do you think that just because a church is a huge church that it's a better church in quality than a smaller church? You could have a big church that's not pleasing to God at all. And you could have a smaller church that the quality, you would have a purity among the people and a love for the Lord that, that is a much higher quality than maybe a bigger church. And so that's what he's referring to, the authority of King Nebuchadnezzar and that Babylonian uh, empire was of a high quality. Now here's, here's where it's headed. It's going to be degraded each time a new world empire comes on the stage. That doesn't mean that, that the next one that came along was inferior because it was smaller. In fact, the Medes and Persians in their empire conquered more of the world than Nebuchadnezzar did as far as quantity goes but it goes down in quality. And that's why you see the specific gravity. There have been people who uh, have assigned a specific gravity to the gold, I think is like 19 point something. And then you go down to the silver and the specific gravity of the silver is down to about 11. And then you go down to the, the brass and the specific gravity of the brass would be what, maybe six or something like that. And then the iron, uh, smaller than that and the, uh, and the clay 1.6 or something and so what does that tell us that tells us that this huge statue is top heavy the gold on top has the heaviest specific gravity of metal the purest and most valuable 
it's heavy. You go to the silver, it's a little lighter. Go down to the brass, a little lighter. Down to the iron, lighter. The clay, very light. And so you've got a huge statue that's heavy on top and gets lighter as you go down in specific gravity. It's a top-heavy statue. And that's why when the stone hits it on the feet, it's going to topple very easily. So look at it again in verse number 39. He says there's going to be another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. So it's big, but it's not as authoritative. There's, there's some considerations to think about here. First of all, <coughs> we don't see evolution and progress here. Each society, think about this, each society beginning at, uh, at the statue's golden head with Nebuchadnezzar, society goes down a little bit in the next phase, next world empire. Society gets a little more corrupt and deteriorates a little bit more as it goes down then to the brass. And it goes down, down, down to the iron and the clay and deteriorates more. Society is, I, I think we could describe it instead of evolution. Evolution is like man is getting better. Man is getting better. Man is getting better. And, uh, and so evolution says everything is getting better. Well, I don't think we have evolution shown here in this statue. We have devolution. It's going downhill. And everything's getting worse. I think, our, I think our society is in very sad shape today. I think we see people, the uh, president cries, whether his tears were real or not, you can be the judge. But when he cries, wanting to take guns away from law-abiding citizens, which is promised to us in the Constitution, when he cries about wanting to take guns away and he doesn't cry, about the millions of babies who are murdered year after year after year. Our society's headed downhill. It ain't going up. And while we can, while we can say, you know, maybe, uh, maybe our society's better, uh, and we look back at the Marxists, maybe in Stalin and, uh, and some, of the, uh, some of the dictators of the world who killed millions of their own people, we killed millions of our own people. We just do it a little more dignified behind hidden doors under the guise of legality. So our society is not better. We're still killing and murdering people. We just do it in a little more dignified fashion and say that it's okay. No, it's getting better or worse, I'm sorry. And, and the, the Bible says that there shall come a great falling away first before the Antichrist comes on the scene. And so our our world is headed downhill, and we, thank goodness, we have Christians in the world who are supposed to shine as bright lights, the Bible says in Philippians, as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. That's us. Well, that's the disintegration. It's a divinely conquered world. Verse number 40, uh, 44 says, and in the days of these kings shall be the God of heaven set up a king, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Would you underline that word? Never. <laughs> never be destroyed. What's going to happen to the head of gold? It's going to give way to the empire of silver. The empire of Greece. What's going to happen? Or to the Medes and Persians, I'm sorry, and then to Greece. And then, and then what's going to happen? It's going to give way to the Roman Empire. And, uh, and so those empires are going to vanish. But when God comes and sets up his kingdom, it says it will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Christ's kingdom will never end. Thank God for that. It's a divinely conquered world. God will conquer all the kingdoms of the world through Jesus Christ when he returns. And then the continuance of the heavenly kingdom is forever. And it's a divinely confirmed word. Verse 45, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, 
and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, and the clay, and the silver, and the gold. Daniel's given the interpretation of this. The great God hath made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So Daniel gives the king the dream in detail. Then he gives him the interpretation of the dream. What's the interpretation? You're going to have a head of gold, and you're going to have each kingdom coming in success, successively. And then in the last days, just uh, uh, after the church is raptured out, we're going to see the revived Roman Empire. That's the part clay and part iron. It will be a brutal kingdom. The iron will be brutal. And uh, this, this revived Roman Empire, some believe that it's uh, going to be the, a ten-nation confederation in Europe. I read something interesting today by a commentator who wrote this years and years ago, but it struck my fancy today. Uh, King was the commentator's name, and he wrote this back before the Muslims were, were gaining any prominence like they are in today's culture and today's world. And he contends that the part iron and part clay is not a revived uh, ten federation of nations in Europe, but he, he submits that, that iron and clay that don't mix, that it's the Muslim and, uh, and Jewish connection and the rest of the world. Actually, the Muslims don't mix with anybody. They just don't mix. It doesn't matter if it's a Jew or a Christian or anything. I mean, you go to any part of the world. You go to India, uh, and you'll find that, that the Muslims hate the Hindus. The Muslims hate the Buddhists. They hate the Christians. They hate the Jews. They hate anybody who is a non-Muslim. They even hate each other at times. And, uh, and so the Muslim influence will not mix. But there is, have you heard about the prophecy in, uh, in Islam about the 12th imam? The twelfth imam is supposed to come on the scene. They're expecting their own Messiah. And, uh, and the twelfth imam, well, back in, after Muhammad, the founder of Islam, after he, uh, after he died, his cousin claimed to be his successor, uh, the next imam, and then there were, there were a total of 11 of them. And then the last one, uh, Mahdi, was born and uh, they, he, he had been sought out to be assassinated, to be killed, and so it was said, now this is, this is not Bible, this is from Islamic tradition and their own Islamic writings. They say that the 12th imam disappeared into the wilderness and been hiding out in caves ever since. He was six years old, and, uh, and he's going to make a spiritual revival, a spiritual reappearance, at the end time and they believe that he is going to be the Messiah and that Jesus will be subservient to him, the Mahdi and, uh, and, and he will be the 12th Imam and that he will come this is, this is their language the Islamic writings say that he will come as a man of peace a man who will restore unity to the world and I'm thinking it sounds like the Antichrist and there are, there are commentators who believe that there could be a Muslim antichrist. Now, I've always been under the impression that it would probably be a Roman, possibly even a Jew, that he would rise up in, uh, in Europe. But with that was before I saw the way things are going. Now, I don't know. This would be an interesting. The Bible doesn't say what he's going to be exactly. There's a lot of Muslims in Europe and, uh, and, and, and France, as we have seen recently, has been overrun with them. Uh, there's many of them that are flooding in from Syria into all kinds of, all of these uh, European nations. Some of them are coming here. And, uh, and so they're infiltrating the whole world. And I think that's by design, that they're infiltrating the world and uh, they're coming and, and they keep telling us they're peaceful, you know. And if you believe that, I've got some oceanfront property in Kansas I want to sell you. 
they're peaceful, they say. And this 12th imam will appear on the scene and he will say peace to everybody. And if you've got a good Muslim who wants to settle all the other Muslims down, how many people would run to accept a guy like that? Oh, I've seen crazier things happen. Worth consideration at least. I don't know who the Antichrist is going to be. I don't think anybody else does either. Uh, but it's worth some thought. Notice lastly, the, Daniel's public triumph in verses 46 through the end of the chapter. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel. Well, so he had a public triumph. Then the king praised Daniel, verse 47. Well, verse 46 says he commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. Now the king's fallen in love with Daniel now. Verse 47, the king answered unto Daniel and said of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. Well, no, wait, just over there a few, few verses back, Daniel makes the statement that Nebuchadnezzar is a king of kings. Some people think that's irreverent to call Nebuchadnezzar a king of kings because that's a title for our Lord. But in a very practical sense, Nebuchadnezzar was a king of kings. He had conquered all the other kings, and so he was a king over all the other kings of the earth, but not king of God. And so here he recognizes that Daniel has a God who seems to be bigger than any of the gods he's known anything about. He said, He is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal the secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man. That means he became important. Kind of like, reminds, does this remind you kind of of Joseph down in Egypt? <laughs> he made him a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. So the king praised Daniel. The king promoted Daniel. And then Roman numeral three on your outline is Daniel's practical teaching. I just want to make one last application before we quit. This image that that the whole chapter has been about, this top-heavy image, the golden top and the, tier, the, the devaluation of each metal down and the, the nature of this image was to be toppled over. I think about stability. That image was not stable because these world kingdoms did not recognize God. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, he gave some... He gave some recognition to God here, but he didn't submit to God's kingship over him. And neither did these other kingdoms. They've all been adverse to God. In our own lives, we can become unstable and not enjoy success and victory like we should in our own lives. Instability like that image, it would be so easy to knock over. When we don't have a good foundation, are you listening to me? If we don't have a good foundation under us, we will be easy to knock over. When somebody gets saved, first thing they ought to do is make up their mind, I'm going to surrender to God. I'm going to surrender to live according to His book. I'm going to, I'm going to do everything that God wants me to do. I'm going to learn everything that God wants me to learn. I want to learn the foundational principles so I lay down a solid foundation from God's Word upon which to base myself so I don't get knocked over. Instability is the killer of spirituality. The Bible says over in the book of James, a, a double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man. When we make up our mind that we're going to live for God, we're going to, we're going to get in. I'm starting, a, I'm starting a Sunday school class in the next week or two, I think. As soon as I get some people together that, that will, will sit in it, you'll be invited and nobody has to come. But we'll, uh, we'll take another room, maybe, uh, maybe one upstairs, and, and, uh, and it's just going to be a foundations class. And it's going to be for people that want to start in and just lay a solid foundation for their whole Christianity based on the Bible because here's what happens people get saved and because they don't get the foundational truths laid down first then they learn some bigger things later on maybe some prophecy and then they get the big head over knowing the prophecy 
and they say, well, I've got this all figured out. I know when Jesus is coming back. <laughs> I know who the Antichrist is going to be. I know how everything is going to turn out. And the next thing you know, they get smacked and they fall over because they didn't have their foundations down right. If we get our foundations down right, we'll know how to plan our family. We'll know how to be financially stable. I'm talking about where you have as much money as there is months. <laughs> I'm talking about having, having a plan for a family that's built by God's design. I'm talking about getting stable in church where you where when other things come up, you don't say, oh, that sounds like more fun over there. I'll miss church and go do that. That's where we head astray, and that's when we get top-heavy and fall over. And so anybody that wants to get in on the foundations class, let me know, and we'll start here in another week or two. I hope the image of this. Did, you get, did I get all the blanks filled in? Everybody get all the blanks? Okay. Sometimes I, I miss one and don't realize it. This image is just a picture of world history. The time of the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles begins when? It begins with Nebuchadnezzar here in the book of Daniel. The Babylonian Empire, is, that's when Gentile empires trample over Jerusalem until the time of the end. And the times of the Gentiles will end when the tribulation is over and Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom. That's the times of the Gentiles. We live in the times of the Gentiles, and we will until the millennial reign of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us with the knowledge that will help us to lay the foundations in our own lives so that, Lord, we're not top-heavy like that, like that uh, statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Lord, help us to love the Word of God. Help us to stay in it. Help us to be faithful to church. Help us to be faithful to our families. Lord, help us to be faithful to communicate with you and to find your will for our lives every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you'd stand as she plays, we'll have a verse or two of invitation. If anybody needs to pray, feel free to come.